One of the greatest queens to ever rule over England was Queen Elizabeth I. When she was ruling during the 16th and start of the 17th century, she would have to deal with a massive number of threats to her reign. Many believed that she would not be strong enough as a ruler, but she would be ruthless and she would sentence many of her rivals to death and would dispatch them brutally. She would condemn Mary, Queen of Scots, to death and she would lose her head by axe, but Elizabeth was cold and calculated. And she would, in her final years, even order the executions of some of her closest friends. She would also defeat the Spanish Armada, which was the most fierce and feared naval fleet at the time, and Elizabeth was loved by her people. However, as 1603 came around, Elizabeth was not well, and she would give up on life as many of her friends passed away around her, and the Queen decided she did not want to live any more. But following her funeral and burial, her vault, where she was laid to rest, would be broken into, and what those people found was shocking and remarkable. Early in the morning of the 24th of March 1603, Queen Elizabeth I died. She had lived and ruled for a rather long time, and her death signalled the end of the Tudor period, and also the Elizabethan era. And with this she would be succeeded by the Scottish King, who then became known as James I. James was the son of the former monarch Mary Queen of Scots, who Elizabeth executed. But Elizabeth had been ill for a number of months and her health was getting worse, and by the standards of a woman of the early 17th century, she was considered rather elderly. During the Tudor period, there were many deadly diseases which could strike someone down, and the Queen would get over some of these, such as smallpox, throughout her life. But many of her friends were dying around her, and Elizabeth was lonely, which made her decline much sharper. But in her final days, she appeared depressed and vacant, and she would contemplate her demise, and many thought she was assessing her life, and in particular, some of her decisions. For example, ordering the execution of an anointed queen. Because of this, she worried about the afterlife, and Elizabeth I was 69 when she passed away. She was accompanied on her deathbed by the Archbishop of Canterbury, who promised that she would go to heaven, and he told her to stay faithful to God in her final moments, and that she did die. She would rule again in heaven as a queen. He said there was a throne for her in the afterlife, and in her final moments her throat swelled up, and speaking became difficult, and the queen then gave up her fight. Inside of her private chambers and bedroom at Richmond Palace, Elizabeth I died. And she did give specific instructions for how her body should be treated after her death. She did not like the idea of being disemboweled, and she also was scared of being embalmed and having her insides and organs removed and then buried somewhere. Elizabeth specifically said she did not want this to happen. Doctors, however, would take no notice of this and they would cut the Queen's body open anyway, remove her organs and her heart, and then allegedly embalm her, using spices and herbs which were placed inside of her cavity. But it was a good thing that they did disregard the Queen's wishes, as during her funeral procession, her body did allegedly explode with a violent gas which even splintered part of her coffin. This would have been much worse, if the embalming process had not happened. Elizabeth I was then left inside of a lead coffin in Richmond Palace, and her final resting place would be Westminster Abbey, and there was a significant journey to transport the Queen's body. The journey to Westminster began, and Elizabeth was taken down the River Thames on the Royal Barge to the Palace of Whitehall. Her coffin had been draped in black velvet, and six of her ladies kept a close watch at all times as part of their final duties. It was said on the Thames that the oars at every stroke did tears left fall, and the people of London were gutted about losing their queen. But the queen's body had been wrapped tightly in the coffin in cerecloth when the alleged explosion took place, but her remains, regardless, continued on to Westminster Abbey. On the 28th of April 1603, the funeral procession occurred to Westminster Abbey. It was said by onlookers that the city of Westminster was surcharged with a multitude of all sorts of people in their streets, 
houses, leads and gutters that came to see the obsequies. There was such a general sighing, groaning and weeping, as the like has not been seen or known in the memory of man. Elizabeth I's coffin was decorated with a large effigy of the Queen on top. This was dressed in the Queen's Parliament robes, and it had on her head the crown of the Queen. In her hand was the sceptre of her reign, and the effigy was made from wax and wood. But for the people looking on, in London, this was the first time that they had seen an image of the Queen. The coffin was pulled by four horses and was carried into Westminster Abbey for the funeral service. The funeral of the Queen was conducted by the Dean Andrews, and following the ceremony, her coffin was carried into the Henry VII Lady Chapel. To begin with, Elizabeth I was actually interred inside of the same vault and burial site as her grandfather, Henry VII, and Elizabeth of York, the founders of the Tudor dynasty. This was seen as a huge honour, and she was placed under the tomb also. However, this was done as a tribute. In 1607, though, a few years after its interment, her body would then be moved elsewhere. James I, her successor, ordered Elizabeth's coffin to be moved and placed in the same vault of her half-sister Mary I, or Bloody Mary. He also ordered that, symbolically, Elizabeth's coffin should be placed above Mary's to symbolise her greatness over Mary. It was said that 46 shillings and 4 pence was paid for the removal of the Queen's body to her new resting place, and finishing off this new burial site was a huge tomb for Elizabeth, showing the Queen in her royal regalia, looking grand in her final years. This is still today a spectacular monument, and Mary still lies underneath her half-sister, with their coffins placed on top of each other. However, during the 1800s, the tomb and vault of Elizabeth I was broken into by curious religious figures. In 1880, a book was published by the Dean of Westminster Abbey, Arthur Stanley, and he had sought special permission and access by Queen Victoria to carry out an inventory of the royal burials inside of the Abbey. He was looking for King James I's coffin, and this had been lost, and he would find this inside of the vault of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, meaning James moved Elizabeth I out of this vault to then have himself placed in here. However, he explored an aisle underground at the east end of the tomb of Elizabeth I and her monument, and he found a small opening in the walls. He then crept through and found the small burial vault of Elizabeth I, and in here he also found the coffin of Mary. He wrote of the coffins of Elizabeth I and the burial vault that the excavation, however, had almost laid bare the wall immediately at the eastern of the monument of Elizabeth, and through a small aperture a view was obtained into a low, narrow vault immediately beneath her tomb. It was instantly evident that it enclosed two coffins and two only and it could not be doubted that these contained Elizabeth and her sister Mary, the upper one larger and more distinctly shaped in the form of the body, like that of Mary Queen of Scots, rested on the other. There was no disorder or decay, except the centering wood had fallen over the head of Elizabeth's coffin, and that the wood case had crumbled away at the sides and had drawn away part vault of the decaying lid. No coffin plate could be discovered, but fortunately, the dim light fell on a fragment of the lid slightly carved. This led to a further search, and the original inscription was discovered. There was a Tudor badge, a full double rose, deeply but simply incised in outline on the middle of the cover. On each side, the August initials E.R., and below the memorial date, 1603. The coffin lid had been further decorated with narrow moulding panelling, the coffin case which was of inch elm, but the ornamental lid containing the inscription and panelling was a fine oak, half an inch thick, laid on the inch elm cover. The whole was covered with red silk velvet, of which much remained attached to the wood, and it had covered not only the sides and ends, but also the ornamented oak cover, as though the bare wood had not been thought rich enough without the velvet. The sight of this secluded and narrow tomb 
thus compressing in the closest grasp the two Tudor sisters, partners of the same throne and grave, sleeping in the hope of resurrection. The solemn majesty of the great queens thus reposing, as could hardly be doubted by her own desire on her sister's coffin, was the more impressive from the contrast, its quiet calm with the confused and multitudinous decay of the Stuart vault, and of the fullness of its tragic interest with the vacancy of the deserted spaces which had been here hitherto explored in other parts of the chapel. The vault was immediately closed. This was the final time that Queen Elizabeth I had her burial vault opened, and this is the final account we have as what it looks like to this day. There may have been curious members of staff inside of the Abbey who have peered into the vault to see Elizabeth's coffin and the state it is four hundred years since she died, but Elizabeth's remains are still marked today by the large tomb and effigy of her that sits on top of her coffin. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.